I would, um, before we start, like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we're meeting here today and pay my respects to their elders past and present and any um, Aboriginal members of the, our communities that are here today. I'd also like to thank our four um, panellists for um, taking the time out to become um, part of this session and to support the ongoing emergency management conference. Um, perhaps, um, would you like to introduce yourselves using the mic so we can record it? Thanks. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Leading Senior Constable Gabrielle Tayak. Obviously, I'm with Victoria Police. Uh, I've been uh, with Victoria Police for um, about 13 years, and I was in New South Wales Police for three years before that. And I've been an LGBTI liaison officer since 2008, full time. I come from the Gender and Disaster um, Pod, which is an initiative of two women's health services in Victoria and Monash University, and we are filming it as, to put on our website as an um, informative video for our users and such. Sure. Uh, hi, Janine Taylor from sunny Brisbane uh, with the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. Um, I've been with QFES for 17 years, and prior to that was a police officer in New Zealand if you hadn't noticed the uh, accent there. Um, I'm a proud gay woman, and sorry to come out so early, and if, if that makes some people feel uncomfortable, I just didn't want you sitting there just wondering, because you can't tell I'm gay, right? <laughs> so, just wanted to put that out there. There you go. And I already came out in the earlier <laughs> session. Round of applause. <laughs> um, my name's Bronnie McIntosh. I'm with Fire and Rescue New South Wales. And I've been with them as a firefighter for 15 years. I've been a station officer now for the last two and a half years. Currently in a training role. And uh, have been to this conference a few times. So pretty, pretty pleased to see it moving in this direction and um, expanding its inclusivity. And proud to say that just this year, Fire and Rescue New South Wales has created its first LGBTI support network for the organisation. I think there's about four people in it. That's all right, it's a start. Um, my name's Heather Lake and I work with the Inspector General for Emergency Management. That's part of the Victorian Government's Department of Justice and Regulation. I'm part of the uh, Emergency Management Conference Committee, so part of the organising committee. I'm also uh, an ally member of the um, Victorian Public Sector Pride Network. So it gives me great pleasure in um, chairing this session. It's um, meant to be informal, despite the... Um, the setup. <laughs> so um, invite um, conversation at any point. One of the um, things that uh, Liam alluded to, which I think we'd missed in, uh, if anyone went to his session and had completely overlooked with the conference committee was the uh, SICK reference with the um, acronym with the safer, inclusive and connected title or theme that we're running the conference under. And I thought that's pretty cool. But um, then sort of thinking how this session would run and um, just thinking to look um, in emergency management, I think we are quite risk adverse and yet we want to be responsive to our, the communities that we serve. And I sort of wondered about why we use safer rather than safe. We're not quite ready to commit to safe. And I just wondered what uh, thoughts you guys had on um, safer versus safe. Can we ever be safe? Sorry, I missed it. Yeah, through um, our Priority Communities Division, which is part of our part of Victoria Police, which looks at all our vulnerable communities within Victoria, we uh, we certainly have a recruitment drive for diverse communities to join Victoria Police. And one of the main conversations we've had regarding the LGBTI community is, can we um, openly try and recruit people from these communities? when we're not sure if we are a safe mm -hmm. workplace. Yeah. And we're doing a lot of work within the organisation to make it safe, but are we safe enough yet to say, hey, come and join us because we are safe and you will be safe in our organisation. Mm. So we're at the point where we're almost there, but we're not willing to... We are, at, we are definitely recruiting and wanting LGBTI people in the organisation because there's a lot of us here already, but we don't want to have a big drive for this community when we can't ensure that it is safe, mm. particularly for transgender and gender diverse community. Because we have a few um, members that are from the, the gender diverse community. We've got a lot of lesbians, gays and, and, bi and some bisexuals, I'm sure. But trans is the new area we, we've got to focus on and make sure that we can 
be safe. Thank you. Yeah, that's certainly the angle that um, I, I was coming from, going to come from as well. Um, we um, had uh, uh, an incident a couple of years ago, um, a sexual harassment incident, which um, has given us an opportunity to transform our culture, um, and that's certainly the journey that we're, we're on. I think safer um, is, is the context around that where everybody, no matter who you are, um, can feel safe to come to work and, and be your true self. Um, that extends to, um, I guess, being able to disclose in, in our culture um, if you have a family member who's gay. So I think there's some, some people within our organisation that don't even feel free to be able to talk about their family members. Not, you know, they're straight themselves, but uh, to allow that context. And we had a good example of uh, um, one of our assistant commissioners coming out as having a gay son. Um, and he did that quite publicly on Facebook, and the positive uh, feedback was overwhelming. We had other senior officers coming out as having gay children as well, um, and also um, it was, a, I suppose, a bit of a switch for us, and people were saying that this is QFAS growing up, and we're not, you know, there by a long shot, but it really is, it sort of pushed us on that, on that journey um, as well. I'll just add to that that in New South Wales, we're a lot like Gabby is talking about with Vic Police in that we are actively recruiting into the LGBTI communities. We will always have a, uh, a float in Mardi Gras, we're at Fair Day, but we're not doing anything to ensure the safe environment in our culture and we have recognised <laughs> that there are some major issues there and some a lot of backlash, but at the moment there's no connection between recruiting more people into our not so inclusive workplace. Hmm. Yeah. Where's my microphone <laughs> attendee? <laughs> You're on Facebook, weren't you? Sorry, you can start oh. um, I just wanted to ask, we, we go through this process of, of talking about our sexuality and our preferences and stuff like that. Do you think maybe we actually need to tackle the more deep-rooted unconscious bias that's within our society rather than actually having to celebrate, hey, I'm heterosexual, or, oh, you're homosexual. Or, I, I don't know, I, I just think that coming, having to... I mean, I'm really... Janine, you sat there and you said, I'm gay, and I just want to let you know. And that's really good. I'm glad, you know, that's fine. And so I'll just say, I'm heterosexual. I want to let you know. <laughs> so it, it's, it should be a two-way discussion rather than just... It just seems so one-sided at the moment, that's mm. all, and, and I just don't think it's... We shouldn't have to make it necessary for people to actually... Like your assistant commissioner uh, announcing on Facebook, why does he have to do that? Mm. Anyway, just my thought. Oh, no, I when you're coming up, Steve, one of the um, speakers yesterday, it may have been Kristen Hilton, made the comment that um, there's no stereotypical Australian, but we certainly share stereotypical opinions about well, what a stereotypical Australian is. So I think your comment about, really, why this sort of, um, why do we even need to have a diversity stream at this conference? Because if we were truly one community, then we would celebrate the, the strengths and not have to work so hard devoting our energy to the battles. Yeah, uh, I'll just tackle, uh, respond to those two things. Uh, part of my saying I'm gay was a bit of a comment comic relief, I suppose, just to break the ice, but also about, you know, visible and non-visible um, diversity. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been chased out of the toilet by an Asian woman because she must have thought I was a bloke. Um, you know, so to, for me to uh, feel comfortable uh, presenting in a more masculine way, um, there was a bit of a, a, bit of a um, comic relief, you know, touch at that as well in saying that, you know, not all diversity can be seen. You know, um, uh, and with the assistant commissioner, it was um, a watershed moment for him in feeling safe in his, his workplace to be able to disclose that his son was gay, but also as coming out as LGBTI champion that he's been contacted by people in the organisation who um, are gender or sexually diverse um, but are not ready to come out at work. So just knowing, and they've said to him, just knowing that he's there um, to support them as a senior leader in our organisation has been, um, has been you know, really important for them. Thank you. I was just going to say, I think it's an unfortunate 
part of the human condition is that we, in our minds, we always need to put things into some usable filter, whether it be at a box or something. So I think that sometimes that's what happens if you ask something other than what the majority norm is. And that's part of, um, I guess, what Liam was trying to explain is that these are conscious and unconscious decisions you make constantly as you navigate your way in the workplace, in your home life, in the world, because you have this, you are in these other filters or boxes that you know are different from what a mainstream norm is. So you're right, it shouldn't be that we need to lead with our sexual orientation, um, but as, as that something other than the norm, you're, you're constantly aware of that, I guess. And when you are that norm, as we found in the session with Liam, you don't know. It's an invisible privilege to have nine out of ten, or ten out of ten of the markers of normality. I don't know if that made sense to that question. Um, one of the um, other... Oh, yes? <laughs> I think one of the other comments that um, that came out of um, yesterday's presentations was about um, emergency management always wanting to do things the right way because we have legislation, we have prescribed arrangements in responding, you know, before, during and after emergencies, but is that necessarily doing things for the right reason? I think that's one of the strengths of the exploring the diversity in emergency management we now get to challenge. Are we, yes, we might be doing things the right way to save people and property, but are we doing things for the, the right reasons? Um, I think that one of the challenges, and I don't know if anyone else has noticed the irony of the image behind you yeah. of the, <laughs> this is the stereotypical male saving lives, mm. woman at home looking beautiful. So there's gender <laughs> messages there, there's, you know... No, that's normal. Oh, no, 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 I know that's normal, <laughs> but the irony that we're talking about that, in th and that's in this room, what we're talking about. That. Yes. Yeah. Without our sponsors, we couldn't be here today, so I do need to thank our sponsors, including Pelican. I just want to um, continue some of the things that we were saying before about our, our workplaces becoming safe or safer. Um, certainly, since I've been doing this job, I've noticed a huge change in how people respond to the fact that we exist within the organisation. So um, we're GLOWS, so gay and lesbian liaison officers, which are now broaden that meaning to be LGBTI liaison officers. And I'm full-time, like I said, whereas we've got about 200 other ones in stations all across the state who do it as a portfolio, so just an additional role. Um, but when I applied for this position, um, there was no one else who applied for it in the entire organisation. And a lot of people want to move around and try different roles within the police. And this was a role that I was really interested in. It was totally different to what I would normally do as a police officer. I wasn't responding to jobs anymore. I was going out and being proactive and engaging with the community, which is a, I think is a fantastic different side of policing. Um, and now, eight, nine years later, people would kill me for this job. Um, and I pretty much would have to die to leave this job, I think, because I love it. Um, <laughs> But uh, so we've got 200 GLOWs all around the state and, and almost half of them don't identify as LGBTI. So when I went for the job, it was, oh my God, better not apply for this, people might think I'm gay. Now everyone's putting their hand up saying, I really like community engagement, I believe in, in working with this community and people are keen to do it. So mm -hmm. nine years later, yeah. completely different environment. Do you think, um, Gabby, that that's a reflection of emergency service agencies taking note of what actual our community composition is and rather than portraying our service and our service delivery representatives as this is what we think you want. It's like, okay, maybe you don't. Maybe, you know, people do. Actually, there are humans out there that recognise as, you know, Aboriginal, LGBTI, and maybe that's what they want to see when that person turns up. I think it follows on how just the general population is changing and becoming more inclusive and accepting. So as mainstream, like large organisations of just basically as we're part of the community, we follow along with that. Mm. Um, and I'll just show you one thing, which I'm very, very proud of. So this, is, this is what we wear with our uniform. Oh. 
not the chapa chap, that was not a police <laughs> issue. Um, but so I went to a conference in Amsterdam, which was the first international law enforcement um, conference last year. And I saw an American police officer with, on the back of their vest, they had something very similar. And so I've come back from Amsterdam and put in numerous reports and it's not yet um, available for all the clothes to wear, but I've been given permission to wear it to certain community events. Mm. And basically it breaks down barriers immediately. And not only for the community that we're going out and serving, um, that m makes them feel safe. We'll just pop it down, it's fine. Um, <laughs> but it also shows members, um, Victoria Police members of all ranks, that we're inclusive mm. and that you can be part of this community or, or be an ally of this community and it's fine. And it's, it's perfectly fine. Um, so I've been wearing it to um, equal love rallies and have, I've had people come up to me who say, I'm absolutely terrified of the police. I will never, ever approach a police officer. And, I'm, and I say, well, you're talking to me right now. And they say, simply because I feel safe because of mm. this branding. So um, it's going through our uniform committee. It's very hard to change our uniform as, as it would be for any organisation in the emergency services. But I've got support from pretty much everyone at, at this stage. So hopefully by next year's Pride March, the members marching in Pride March will all be wearing this, mm. which is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So did you have a question for the panel? Uh, or I'll look probably more at comment. Okay. term I haven't heard before that he was coming out as a father of a gay person um, and that's a particularly difficult thing and I, I'm guessing um, you know I'm not gay so I don't know what it's like to come out as a gay person although I have a son who's gay who didn't seem to have any issue in coming out as a gay person whatsoever and some of those prejudices that are getting broken down very quickly um, through our younger people I don't I don't see us having this conversation Hello. In the discussion about making our organisations uh, safer for for people from from groups for, from any group that's not very well represented in in our services at the moment, there's always that um, that issue. It will never be. I don't want to talk you know about critical mass, but you sort of you need to encourage people to apply. Um, how safe? It's it's not going to be perfectly safe for the first people coming in, or as those numbers start start to grow. So what? What measures, what can we practically do to help, to help the early arrivals, to help the people that as the numbers grow, when you, you still haven't, the cultural change isn't embedded yet and there's, there's still a lot of issues, what are the measures that you can, you can do to make it a little bit, a little bit safer while well, that's occurring? Um, so onboarding, we're, we're working on new onboarding, which obviously you know, is an important part of, of, of bringing people into the organisation. Um, we're also, um, you know, some uh, organisations have specific um, ally groups. Um, we're taking a little bit of a different tact in, in that we are um, sort of following on from our um, Queensland Government Inclusion Champions of Change, although I thought I came up with the idea first. So we're having, a, <laughs> we're having an Allies of Inclusion, okay. um, and so it's all in. Uh, and then from that we'll draw resource groups. So there will be support in that way. We also, am going back to the safer workplace, very early on I had a discussion with the manager of um, our fire and emergency services support network, so our peer support and counsellor services. Um, and he very quickly, without any um, strategy or action plan or anything like that, uh, went and made sure that he had um, specialist counsellors on his list and that the, his web page reflected that in that if you were looking for a counsellor for yourself or family member, you could search um, by LGBTI services. And uh, also we're potentially looking at sourcing peer support, existing peer support members who may be interested in some extra training to assist staff, volunteers and their families if they're having any issues. Um, so, yeah. Mm. I think um, on the other side of that, rather than looking at what we can do already from the inside is to start looking about on the outside and through our community engagements and really pushing harder to shift our culture away from that response focus and these stereotypes and imaging into that preparation and preparedness focus 
where our workforce is out engaging with the community, spending time with them to understand who our community actually is and what they look like and all of these different groups, and then that being an opportunity through home fire safety audits or whatever, that be also a recruitment kind of exposure opportunity through preparation for, for those different groups. That It's kind of a weird way to look at it, I know, but um, I think that part of what we're doing constantly is just reconfirming this response identity that is excluding and is not welcoming to minority groups. So mm -hmm. the more that we do all these different recruitment measures and try to set up things to be more inclusive, until we move away from that focus on response only, I don't, I don't see that we're going to get it mm -hmm. to be safer inside yeah. our organisations. I just wanted to add on to your point because um, I come, at, come from it from a very different perspective because I'm not part of emergency services but we've been researching in that space for a long time and what we found in our research very much echoes that point that engaging with the community, with, with women's services, with LGBTI specific groups um, that provide those kind of services or within other services is the key to changing um, the relationship with the community and changing that particular stereotype of what is an emergency service person and a relationship with them more than just being rescued during a disaster and what happens afterwards. And that changing that relationship with the community is the first step to changing how the organisation sees their role and responds to people within um, their organisation. Mm. Mm. Yeah. There's some um, like practical, um, you know, moments as well. We we did a, um, a had a fire safety message stand or emergency service, a whole organisational stand with information about fires and disasters and whatnot. And we have um, at, at Fair Day after Pride March in Brisbane, which is in September, which is different to everywhere else, and, and I think it's something to do with the weather. But um, just a simple thing like language. So two older gentlemen were a couple, came walking towards me. We have these wooden spoons. Uh, don't stop looking while you're cooking, uh, <laughs> which is... So I, I just said simply, who's the cook in your family? And the look on their faces for me to actually just say that and recognise them as a as a family, as a couple, um, was, you know, it, for me it was a light bulb moment. I was mm. just like, this is something that we've been missing out on and not taking advantage of these opportunities. So. We um, have started up a student LGBTI network at our police academy. So when people come there on their first day, there's posters everywhere. Um, so they know that they've got support from day one and that it's an inclusive environment so they can be themselves. Uh, we've got a similar thing which was just started probably about 12 months ago within the organisation, so outside the academy in the organisation, so in another LGBTI employees network. And there's also police TV at the academy. So there's a lot of things that we're doing to show people that as an organisation we're doing everything we can or as much as we're able to at this stage to be a safe environment. Mm -hmm. And um, we've, we've had a PSO, so a protective services officer, so they're the police that are at the train stations, who's transitioned um, in the job. Okay. So in the last 12 months. So we're making sure for that person that where they were and where they, they went to was safe and that all the people that they were working with, their colleagues were all educated um, and so I think we're, we're, I think we've come a really long yeah. way, especially in the last probably four, four, three to four years. And we've had the Varioc report, which is the Victorian Equal Opportunity Human Rights Commission report released. Um, I think it was December 2015, and uh, that was about sexual harassment and violence within within Victoria Police, so members against other police members. Um, and that showed there was a quite a high level of sexual harassment um, within the organisation against women, against men who were looked at as effeminate and against lesbians. So um, the response to that and all the recommendations that came out of that report, our Chief Commissioner has basically said, yes, we have to do all those recommendations. And from that, there's been huge changes. And out of that basically has come these LGBTI support networks. Mm. Um, Gabby, that point about leadership from the top, uh, unfortunately it came from 
a massive impetus that didn't naturally start there. But um, I wonder whether the notion of the command and control structures that are in emergency management by their nature are exclusive rather than inclusive. And if that is the case, um, what do you think we, as, a, as, an, as, a, as an emergency management body, what do you think we're willing to give up that would allow inclusion? Um, I might start. Start with the research, yeah, yeah. the evidence uh -huh. base. <laughs> is there anything we're willing to give up to allow people to participate? Um, well, I guess to start with, our research shows that the command and control structure is at the heart of a lot of these issues and was, I guess, the basis of this idea that there's a certain type of person that works within that system, and that was where a lot of the stereotypes were coming from, that it's a strong masculine man saving the woman, and all the resources that have been produced in the last, in the few decades reflect that. So part of the impetus for our research and what we've done is create gender um, and disaster guidelines was based on, we did a survey of the 38 or so um, strategies for emergencies around Australia, state or federally, and about six mentioned gender in some, like in a reasonable detail rather than just saying diversity, gender, LGBTI groups included, and that would be their strategy. So I think that there's a history of that, but it does mean that there's a certain um, type of person that's always been mm. looked at as being suited for this role, and there's room to be inclusive without um, hurting that, because every single LGBTI emergency service person that we've spoken to, any woman in emergency services, they are so passionate for this role, and that's common amongst everyone, mm. and that passion for the role, I think, doesn't differentiate what your orientation is or what gender you are. So clearly there's lots of space for it and they can do just as effective work. There's no, there's no difference. It's just about making them feel welcome and allowing them to progress within the organisation as mm. well. Are there... You know, one of the unique things about our industry is that, you know, our clients don't have a choice about who comes to help them. Um, and that's, mm. that's one of the things that, you know, we, we can never give that up. Um, so the fact that we um, are trying to build inclusive leadership, um, you know, yes, we've got a place for command and control, but there needs to be that, that other soft -er, um side of leadership and um, I suppose that authenticity about, um, you know, treating everyone with respect. Yeah. Um, and that starts in, internally um, with, our, with our own people and making people feel safe. Um, we, we've... Part of our allies of inclusion is that people get a wave, so you feel welcomed. Everyone can expect to feel, feel welcome, accepted, valued, and embraced, and 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 that's something moving forward that you know we're going to try and uh, push through. I think a number of our organisations have to give up the antiquated promotional system into some of the leadership positions and foster lateral transfers from other agencies to ensure that your leadership group mm. has diverse representation and then on that other level of cultural change is that we have to work harder to shift the culture away from, or not away from response, but to, to put more emphasis onto preparation and prevention. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there any questions? I think um, maybe a good time to talk about um, some of the other, I'm sure you've got other exciting programs <laughs> that um, your relative organisations have um, used for gender equity um, measures across either in internally or uh, as a community service that um, Liam obviously mentioned. That's the, the point that, um, that a lot of his work is coming from. Is it about equity rather than equality? And so maybe an opportunity for you to talk about some of the great work you're doing. Or not? <laughs> or I've got another question. I'm happy, to, I'm happy to put it out there as a point of discussion and certainly yeah. for questioning for sure because Fire and Rescue New South Wales is pretty obvious in its equity piece for recruitment mm. in this year's 50-50 quota to get yeah. more women into the job. And then you go to what, um, Gabby, you were commenting earlier, it's fine to have your targets, but what happens when the achievers of the targets join the organisation and yeah. support. We have a there. diversity team um, and I was speaking to one of them in the last few days about recruitment and they were saying, as, as an organisation, we want to mirror the society that we work with and that we serve. So 
we're certainly getting higher up on the male-female side of things. I think we're about 30-something percent female, which is... We wanted to be 50-50, but we're getting there. We're slowly getting there. But then if you're looking at different diversities, different cultures, different backgrounds, nowhere near mm. uh, where we would like to be. And that's about how do you encourage people to join, especially if it, they're coming from different countries who have, a, who have different experiences with police. So that's something that we're working on um, the last few years and, and certainly now. Is that answering the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Do you have some initiatives, do you have some programs that you're working on now to recruit ethnic populations, for example? Mm. Yeah, so similar to my role, we have um, multicultural liaison officers, we have new and emerging community liaison officers, so they are working with those communities and working with our recruitment and doing promotional things like going to their community events. Um, I'm assuming they're doing stuff on um, radio programs. For, for this community, we have, um, we're on Joy 94.9, which is the gay radio station in Melbourne. Um, we have a, a podcast, which is up and running, going on iTunes soon, if not already, um, called The Glow Show. Um, and we, we've had it for many years on Joy. It was once a week, an hour long program, and we stopped for a while because it was too much work. And we had guests from a recruit up to the chief commissioner. So we've probably had four or four chief commissioners as guests on that show. Um, and so th that way we're, we're definitely engaging with the community in a different way and that is also encouraging recruitment because we talk about various roles within Victoria Police. Not only um, how to prevent crime, how to um, report crime, but um, different areas. So we've, we've got a GLOW who's a pilot on our helicopters so in our air wing. Mm. So that's a real sort of macho environment that you wouldn't expect there might be a gay person. <laughs> um, and so we're trying to make sure there's glows in every area and, and having them as guests to show that if you want to join, um, you can pretty much go anywhere within the organisation. <laughs> you, can't, you wouldn't just join and then go, I want to be a glow because I'm LGBTI. Um, I guess in terms of our work, so I mentioned the gender and disaster guidelines that we created last year. Um, this is a little bit way of background. They're divided into three areas, and that covers um, supporting community um, gender equity and diversity, and with that looks at how, we, how the emergency service organisations um, create links in the community and create that trust and relationship before a disaster, so that when it does occur, um, groups feel safe coming to um, particular service organisations and know what to expect from that service organisation, know how they'll be treated and how they'll, they'll be responded to. Um, but also reaching out to different groups that might not have traditional communication methods or come from just different kind of um, backgrounds and to have different family structures and how to interact and create that relationship with them so that they, their fire um, or whatever emergency, their evacuation plan is suited to them and they feel included as part of that um, that part of that process as well. Um, other parts are about communication and messaging and being gender sensitive within that. So this, as you mentioned, was a very great example of the type of messaging that is very common that we would like to see changed within the guidelines. Um, and finally, addressing domestic violence within, um, with, um, within traditional families, but also within LGBTI groups, which normally is completely ignored. So acknowledging that all the research shows that after an emergency, domestic violence skyrockets and addressing that after an emergency, how that can be um, addressed within service organisations because there's very, there's almost no LGBTI specific family violence um, support services. So making sure that those support services that are there um, do address both, all types of families basically. So that's what we created um, last year. And from there we were, um, we have been commissioned by the Department of Premier and Cabinet to look at the specific needs of LGBTI groups um, during and after a disaster and looking at um, looking at this model of, you know, everyone is treated the same, everyone is rescued the same and whether there are, whether diff diverse groups have different needs and how organisations can set up, be set up in a way not to meet everyone's need but be flexible enough to, if someone has a specific need, can they um, be flexible enough to help address that or feel comfortable telling the person that I have a need and I'd like to share that with you. So that's where our current research is. Um, so keep an eye out for that to be published later that this year. Mm. Um, 
yeah, I noticed that um, ambulance service is not represented here today. Uh, are any of you aware of a similar service operating within any of the ambulance, uh, state ambulance services at all? For, for a long time and, and um, just the last probably 18 months, two years, police, fire and ambulance have um, sort of networked um, together uh, in Queensland to, you know, make sure we're showing up for events. And um, so something happened in the last sort of 12 months also sort of coincided with our, our journey was that there was two young uh, uni interns working at Public Service Commission. Um, and very boldly walked into the uh, DG's office and said, you're not doing enough in this space. <laughs> and he just went, OK, <laughs> tell me what I need to do. So we uh, actually coinciding with Ida Hop Day this year. Um, they released, or well, the Queen's Government released the uh, LGBTIQ+, plus is an acronym that we're using, um, Q for queer and questioning, and plus for um, other people not represented by a letter and allies. Um, and it's an inclusion strategy um, which you can have a look, it's on 4gov.qld.gov.au and follow the inclusion path. You'll see some information about um, allies, uh, sorry, uh, inclusion champions of change, which is based on the male champions of change um, and LGBTI being um, one area that is of focus there. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think that's backed up our journey. It's given... Um, an extra amount of legis legit legitimacy to it. Um, and then also, um, I think uh, moving forward, it just um, helps us um, in that space and make sure it's part of our business and something that's not put at risk. The whole inclusion um, piece is not put at risk by changing whims, um, you know, uh, moving forward as, as has happened in the past. So sort of breaks have been put on some of those inclusion strategies and and areas um, around gender and LGBTI and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Mm. So. It's about maintaining that. Um, yeah, how do you find the energy to, um, when you're inside a system, to keep fighting? Um, uh, Susan Alberti was talking about it this morning. And if it's, it's, if it's in your heart, if it's who you are, then you don't give up. But when you've got a world around you that's saying, mm, not sure. <laughs> and, uh, look, I have to be careful not to pigeonhole myself as being, I'm the champion of, you know, everybody who's underrepresented in the, in the organisation because then it's easy for leadership to go, oh, Janine will deal with that. And it's not. It needs to be part of business. So it's about, um, I suppose, facilitating an environment where I can step away and know that it's part of our business and that's not going to be something that slips and slides away um, if it's not, you know, energy's not put into it. Mm. It's just what we do as an organisation. Um, just to add on to that, our research within DELP, found exactly that. There were really great champions within the organisation who were doing amazing work, but it wasn't embedded in most middle management yet. And that was the next step of making sure it was just standard practice as opposed to really great champions who understand the issues and are pushing it really hard, but we don't want anyone to burn out and it wants to be an organisational wide issue. Hmm. Lisa, would you like to talk about EMV and the sector gender and inclusion approach? Or if I put you on the spot, yes, but... No, I'm really taking the Thanks. Just about the two tiers, I guess. The... Thank you. Thanks. So in October last year, the Minister, um, the Victorian Emergency Services Minister, launched the Emergency Management, Diversity and Inclusion Framework. So I think... I think we're all on very similar journeys in our in our organisations. Probably this um, this framework is about making the change as a sector. So there's um, many of the emergency services organisations. In fact, all of the emergency services organisations are represented as part um, of the leadership group that's um, endeavouring to to bring about change. We we also borrowed from some of the male champions of change model and also other um, community models for creating more diversity and inclusion so that it isn't just about a shift in emergency management, it's linking us in to uh, what's occurring in the community. I think it's matching community and societal expectations. Um, we're still, you know, we're early days and, mm. um, and I think it's, but for us we're very, very much focused at the moment on having all of the leadership come together and be, have a very cohesive and 
soon to be a Hope Loud approach. So they're actually all going through an inclusive leadership program together as we speak, so it's quite interesting. And then um, the idea is that we'll hear, hear much more noise very, very soon on this. Thanks, Lisa. Did you want to comment, Ronnie? Oh, no, no, it was just when um, Alyssa was talking. Thank you. When Alyssa was talking before about, um, and Jane Owen, just the programs that are happening, it reminded me that um, in the UK and, and a lot of the fire services there, they have a government reporting system where they get, um, what do you call it, like audited a compliance yeah, kind of, like yeah, like a compliance thing, mm. but they have to ensure that all of their doctrine processes, systems throughout the organisation meet the needs of every kind of special group. Not special group, what did Liam call them? Underrepresented groups. Underrepresented groups. Mm. So I think that would be something on a, on a kind of a bigger scale that would help all of our services in, an, in emergency management if there was some government directive to have to report on what we're doing. Mm. Because at the moment it is a bunch of scattered, passionate people mm. trying to push things and there's just not a collective approach. And I really think that a collective approach enforced by government measures would really see change. Thank you. Um, on that point, I wanted to throw a curly one. So who gets, um, who gets to decide how we connect with our communities and the nature of that connection? Um, you talked, obviously, Gabby, about the, the GLOW network and their liaison officers, but sort of going to that point about what the um, services are willing to give up um, in terms of the broader shared responsibility that we um, badgered as in Victoria, when's the bit where we go, okay, that's enough, now you're, now you're too high maintenance, Go back to where you came from, and um, we'll just take it from here. Um, that's not a question, but are there any comments on um, how inclusive and how connected we want to be? Thanks, Gabby. I think that um, all the GLOWs look forward to the day when we don't need GLOWs anymore. Mm. And so that's the day when yeah. we know that we've, we've succeeded. I think. As a, as a policing organisation, we base um, everything's stat, stats statistically driven, and so how do you measure who who isn't reporting crime to us? Uh, you can only do that through surveys and, and mm -hmm. research and research from and I don't know whether Liam mentioned this he he may not have but research from Victoria from around Australia and from America and the UK show that. Uh, 70 to 80 percent of homophobic and transphobic crimes are not reported to police. Mm. So we've got the same stats here and even as long as the GLOWs have existed, so since 2000 we started in Victoria, um, those figures haven't gone down a, a huge amount. So no matter how much work we're doing, we still have a population that doesn't trust us enough or doesn't feel confident enough or don't think that they're, what's happening to them as a victim is important enough to report. Mm. Once people are reporting, and if you're a victim of crime, you report, then that's when we know we don't need us anymore. So, that, I mean, yeah. that's how we judge things. Yes. And so I'm, I'm not going to be out of a job anytime soon yeah. because as much as we are growing a lot of trust within the community, this, the reports aren't going up. And we know there are a lot of crimes going out there because we know that through just word of mouth and and, and just... You hear you, one person reports a crime and they'll tell you that 10 other people have been victims of a similar thing or, or you see it on social media but it's not actually reported to us. Mm. So we know it's going on but people aren't reporting. So Alyssa, maybe... A huge issue. One, yeah, is that more a societal thing going back to the um, observation before about that's just what happens. It's not going to change, don't bother about it, just it's part and parcel of the territory. I don't know, because there is very much um, strong leadership buy-in. So there is the high-level buy-in to these programs, but our research centre shows it's the middle managers that are resisting, the ones who have been there for a long time in the organisation and are used to how things are done and are very threatened by change. So it doesn't 
I don't think it's as dramatic as it as it sounds. I think actually very like lots of what the organization's already doing just needs to tweak a little bit instead of asking, you know, where's your husband or wife, you ask, you know, where's your family? What's your what who's where's your partner? Simple language changes of how you ask someone those can have a big difference in feeling part of the community rather than being excluded and isolated from how they see a family should be, for example, like a simple example like mm. that. Um, altering your forms just to allow people to identify as a different thing of male and female. Are very simple things that can be done and they're already being done. We give out forms all the time, but just changing those simple things. Um, middle managers need to buy in, but they can be done and they change the way the practice works. So I think that, um, yeah, I don't think it's as, as, as much as a, it, I think the ones who resist it see it as a massive change, but in reality it's it's small incremental things of what's already being done. Mm. I agree, and it's um, it's running an inclusion lens over the things that we already have. You know, we had a look at our um, fire ed program, and something as simple as you know, take this home to mum and dad. And it's not about LGBTI. It's it's you know, there's single parent families, there's children that don't have a mum and dad and live with grandparents. So mm. it's not about being politically correct. It's about having resources that make everyone feel included and not excluded. Mm. That's just such a simple observation and comment. That's one that, yeah, easy to put in practice and yet so, oh, you have to be you know, so... I discussed it with um, like just a, a colleague and having a coffee and she said, well, I grew up with my dad. I didn't know my mum. So if she had read that as a child, as a you know, grade one -er, she she would then have to have answered questions about, well, how come you don't have a mum? So, you know, it's, it's about being inclusive mm. and, and running that inclusion lens over the things we already have that need some, maybe need some minor tweaking. Because mm. otherwise we're just perpetuating those same stereotypes. And the other thing that I think happens is, um, mirrored by that reflection before, is that fire services and emergency services seem to only change at the same rate of social change. Mm. So once society, like um, you said, father of the gay son, um, that once the broader society is more inclusive and accepting, then we'll see better change, I think. Yeah. It's almost like you need a tipping point. I think there was a comment, um, you know, it would have been in yesterday's session about um, uh, populations of communities within organisations are loosely related to the recognition in the labour market. So, you know, it's like that, oh, we're so on trend now because now we've got, you know, 20% of people who recognise as LGBTI, but that's because society in its broader sense has gone, yeah, you know, it's safe, it's fine, you can be who you want to be. And, and um, so that then allows those reflections to come into the part. Now know. we know, you know, it's not a mental illness. Yeah, and it's not catching. Not, not, not five, <laughs> I think, World Health Organisation came out to, see, to say that being gay was actually not a mental illness, and that, mm. you know, that, that, that kicked off Idaho. Um, so it's, it's quite mm. scary. <laughs> There was a fellow um, speaking on Indigenous um, um, traditional burning practices in this room yesterday and talking about his association with the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning and its many iterations. And when he started, um, I guess when he was born and started, he was technically classified as flora and fauna. So that's taken that journey 40 years. I hope this won't be 40 years, but um, yeah, in time things... <laughs> In relation to that point about um, how the culture changes and cultural sh change can be seen as a massive barrier to organizations accepting these policies and changes. But one thing we found in our research with DELP is, again, it was sporadic what, um, what crews were welcoming and what weren't. But what we found is um, lots of the um, captains or leaders that we spoke to were very, um, they actually were really pushing to have more of a gender diversity on their crews because they said when they did have more of a balance with male and female and those of LGBTI or, um, uh, on their crews, they found that the approach to risk and risk taking and decision making was more cohesive and was safer and the practices were, um, were less risky. And they said they actually felt much safer taking a crew out that was more diverse and felt the practices that didn't sort of solely rely on the old traditional structures and the old command and control actually felt like an easier crew to manage and they preferred it to manage than some of the um, rural crews that were male dominated. And that changed the whole culture in that crew in itself and they had no issues and they were very welcoming. Mm. The, the, the sporadic crews that did have that. Um, so cultural shift is seen as a really um, hard thing to address but I think that 
by organisations recruiting the right kind of people and being inclusive and taking complaints seriously when they do arise, culture naturally changes along with that. Mm. I think, I think we can also need to give people space too, to, to be part of that cultural shift. And an example of that is, um, a, 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 I'll tell you a story, uh, a gay firefighter, a female, um, was sitting down with, I would call an old crusty fiery, um, old enough to be her dad, um, and uh, she's in a relationship with a, another female firefighter. Um, anyway, he said, when you first came in the job, he said, I, I didn't agree with women in the job. I was totally against it and didn't think you should be here. Um, but you and the, the two girls, have, you've changed my mind about that. And he said, and then I found out that you were a lesbian and that you were in a relationship and I was completely against that and did not agree with it at all and thought it was wrong. But you've changed my mind on that as well. And then here's the kicker, and Celeste, I know you cried when I said this to you on the phone. Um, he said, and the other day I was sitting at my daughter's wedding and I felt sad. And she was a bit perplexed and said, well, why did you feel sad? And he said, um, I felt sad because you two can't get married. And she was like, wow. And then he said, and heaven forbid when you come and tell me you're going to have children together. So, you know, give people the space to be able to uh, get how the human connection can change, you know, change you inside. So. Mm. Did anybody get tears? Did anybody get tears I then? <laughs> Celeste, did you have another second round? <laughs> Um, listening to your story about your son reminded me that um, I guess uh, um, emergency services kind of has this particular focus. Yes, we're looking at younger people because they're up and coming. They're either going to share the knowledge with their families or their potential um, volunteers or um, paid personnel. But um, one of my friends said, "You've got to you've got to connect with young people." And it, you know, this is LGBTI, might be a bit, oh, don't go there with the, with the kids, you're going to taint them, you know, might catch on. But um, so many of my friends go, no, you know, um, Mia's in school, most of her friends are trans. It's not a big, it's not a biggie, you know, but here it, we get to be adults and then it becomes this really, whoa, how did that happen? But maybe if we just take it, as you said, give everyone a bit of space, look back and see, and it's I actually think, not yeah, I abnormal. Like, yeah, and, and perhaps, is as that comes through their organisation, they've sat at the meal table when people have told homophobic jokes. So it's mm. less safe for them to speak about their gay son or daughter. Um, but, you know, allow people to take control of their where, where their circle of influence is and have the courage to say, you know what, this is my workplace. Um, I, I don't agree with what you're saying. Um, you're entitled to your opinion, but this is our workplace and we, we don't talk like that here and we don't marginalise people because of whatever whatever mm. metric that, you know. So, yeah, I think uh, Mary Barry Luss uh, yesterday afternoon, she was talking about gender-based violence, but the same principle of respect and then calling out poor behaviour. It would also, for some people in some situations, take guts to go, hey, that's not on. Um, and that's probably just as much a challenge for some people as it is... Um, becoming inclusive and recognising their own biases. Hi. Um, I still wonder... Sorry, I you still, are? Um, no. <laughs> I still wonder about the tipping point, because we so many of the anecdotes that we heard, J9, from um, people who find it hard to accept, and we've got, you know, parents that, are, that are, have embraced when they find one of their... when they find... when one of their children come out... <laughs> when they find them... when they come out <laughs> and actually, um, you know, have the conversation with their parents. Um, but it's still that male resistance. I, I can't help, and, and I heard someone in the corridors just earlier, I think intentionally because I was there, talking about the, what, what did I say again? The oppressed, the oppressed male minority. That's what they, or majority it might have been. That's um, what they said in the corridors one. out here. So, yeah, yeah anyway. Um, so it, it tends still to be the, the men that have got the issue about this because we've spoken about this, and I know I've spoken to half the people in the room about it, but... You know, we, we, we proudly, or they proudly celebrate, or yeah, we proudly celebrate our, our gay female footballers, yet there are no gay male footballers, AFL players at all. So Ackerman has got an absolute kicking 15 years ago, or whatever it was when he said, and we've spoken about this, Heather, about how he didn't think AFL was a safe place. If I see AFL get rainbow accredited, <laughs> I'd be wondering how they got that without any openly gay male footballers. And I know they don't have to come out and declare themselves to be, you know, um, you know, valid or legitimate or whatever, but it does make you wonder about, about where is a safe place to come out. Um, the exercise we did earlier today, 
Um, once upon a time, those 10 questions that Liam asked, I think I was sitting down at, I can't remember, at six, and then we did it a month after, a month um, later, and there was, and I sat down, whichever way it goes, either a question earlier or later, because we did have a male firefighter come out in MFB. So it had changed, the workplace question had changed in that period. So, but it just seems like that tipping point, I don't know, I, it just seems like it's an eternity off. And it's dudes, once again, that are going to have to come to um, be challenged on this, I suppose. Mm. Well, it's, it's just a comment. Oh. <clears throat> it's a pride round in the AFL in a week's time, so not this weekend, but the next weekend, so the second annual pride round. So wouldn't it be nice if someone mm. turned up with their boyfriend? And then if you allow people airtime, like that certain football show that I refuse to watch, that is exactly the kind of sentiment that apparently reflects the, the majority and, and makes it an unsafe place for yeah. Well, I, I recruited um, Laura Bailey <coughs> as a GLOW um, because of her status as a football player. Because I figure um, part of the LGBTI community is harder to reach than others. Um, and the lesbian community I found difficult to reach because I reach a pretty big audience through Joy, the radio station, but the people who listen to that tend to be a lot more males than females. Um, and so how do I reach the lesbian audience? Um, and that was through football. That's how I found I thought, well, Laura, I need you on, on my side. And she said, absolutely. And, and, the, and the changes, again, within the organisation is... When I started doing this job, I struggled to find anyone to do the glow role. It was so hard to find them. Um, and like I said, the people are putting up their hands. I went into her police station in Fitzroy and said and had a conversation with her in the watch house about what a, being a glow is and what you do and why you do it. And I walked out of that meeting with three glows because everyone in that office, in that room, said, I want to do it too. So changing, changing mm. environment... Um, and she's going to do wonderful work for us, absolutely. So uh, Casey Conway is a, um, a gay Aboriginal man who maybe came out the last five years but played NRL, um, and he's a great guy. He's on LinkedIn, um, following on, on LinkedIn. He's got LinkedIn. He's got some great um, uh, so insights, and he talks about how he was, I suppose, uh, growing up in school, he knew he was gay, uh, but was on the footy team and so did everything overtly uh, to to be seen as as heterosexual and and it created this you said, two worlds for him where inside he knew he wasn't being true to himself and and you know it's a bit like covering um, any aspect of your life so um, yeah if you're interested in follow Casey Conway. Steve is, like we keep saying, about the wider society. Like, once it gets more accepted for the norm of male behaviour to be widened and there's more... What's your name again, friend? Sorry, Paul, is it? Paul. More. We heard from Paul in the earlier session about being a straight white man but, um, but not fitting that the small band of the alpha male kind of thing. And I think the more that acceptable it is for men to run the whole gamut and a, whole, a wider spectrum of their gender, then that will go a long way to helping that tipping point, I think. You know, less violence in schools, less one-punch things, just it's okay to be along the spectrum, along a continuum of maleness, mm -hmm. and I think then that will be the tipping point that flows over to our services. So just before this, so when we have um, survey results back from the conference last year and the year before, there's there's not that many, but there's enough negative comments about the gender inclusion stuff. Mm -hmm. it, it makes you wonder exactly who they are and where I can find them. <laughs> <laughs> Just whether or not it's actually having any effect. Yeah. Oh, you're so right. Fire stations mm. particularly are yeah. so neanderthalic. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I'm not <coughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm guilty as well. Um, and I'm probably more open than most. And I see fire stations whether they be career or volunteer stations, probably being the last bastion of this bullshit. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. And, and we all, reinforce all, all those things going. constantly. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, we, I, I think uh, gay women are in a much better position to come out these days than uh, 
uh, gay men. <coughs> and, and I said something to someone this morning that I'd be much more comfortable with my daughter joining the service than I would my son. Because yeah. he'd be, to be an openly gay man within the fire services, Jesus, yeah. that'd be hard work. And um, I'm not proud of that in any way, shape, Although, yeah. I, when I came to that QFED leadership thing, think, think about it. Oh yeah, amazing. Open area. Sorry. Um, story. Actually, actually, it's a story. It's not a question, and it's it's supporting about the fire services being quite behind the times. I'm my I work with CFA. My role at CFA is with volunteer sustainability, and one of the things that we're trying to do is to introduce a women's network across a couple of the districts in the southeast region. One of the areas that we're meeting a lot of resistance with is from other women for various reasons, but um, case example just at this conference was that a young woman from one of those districts came up to me and said, oh, I really want to be a part of it, really want to be a part of it, and I gave her details and stuff like that. And she cited difficulties that she has within her volunteer brigade, just trying to push forward ideas and information and stuff like that because she's young and she's a fem She's not that young. I'm old. She's, she's only, you know, she's in her 30s or something like that probably. But the older males of the brigade, the brigade management team, all old, crusty males, they just, they, they just don't recognise what she has to contribute. So she's actually surreptitiously pushed ideas through up to the brigade management team via other males, and they've, they've taken on board her ideas. And then, just not too much later, I had a conversation with another woman who is also a volunteer who's dead set against any form of women's network thing and all that sort of stuff, which is fine, that's, that's fair enough, you know, she can have her opinion. And when I explained the situation of this younger woman, she turned around and she said to me, oh, it's so typical of the younger women, they just want to get, the younger people, they just want to get up into leadership teams straight away. And I said to her, she's Can't not we? that young, <laughs> she's not that young, she has been a firefighter for 15 years. So, <laughs> so some of the, you know, um, um, we've got these entrenched values just across the board and I'm just supporting the whole conversation, the way it's going. Yeah. And it's, it's, you do bang your head against a brick wall, but there are cracks. <laughs> We've just got to find them. You know, you don't become agile by sticking to um, a, a, a same thought. You've got to have um, diversity of thought. And with, with, with visible diversity, you get diversity of all those other things as well. Um, Hello again. So I was just wondering, do you have suggestions or practical examples from your own experience of how you can translate those changes and discussions that might be happening at the leadership management level into, you know, into the mess room, into the into the station, or even, you know, I think Alyssa, you might have raised the traditional blockers of middle management, um, how you can sort of you know, break through um, in that line as well. I saw firsthand something that was really effective, and I, I really love what the points that you raised down there. What's your name? Sorry. Oh, my name's Sandy. Sandy. Yeah. Great point, Sandy, because it, um, these are really key issues. Often we focus on what the marginalised white male feels about it all, and often one of the biggest barriers to change are women themselves. So I think that's good. You know, there's lots of issues about covering and uh, women who who actually are getting into the same mindset to, um, to block other women um, mm. doing that. But um, one, one thing that I saw work so effectively, and it sounds, Steve will think I'm just totally name dropping, but Danny Cotton, the yeah. London Fire Brigade Stop Commissioner, <laughs> <laughs> um, told me last year that her and two of her colleagues and um, a, a designated team went out and did these myth-busting forums for firefighters and it was resource intensive, like it probably cost time and money for the organisation to do that, but it, it was at a, cha a real change point in the London Fire Brigade when they had lots of austerity measures and stations were being closed and jobs were, were being struck off. And so a lot of the fear around that was being manifested against other changes for diversity that were happening at the same time. So there was this fear that those jobs were being lost or um, standards lowered to, to get a diverse workforce. And so the London Fire Brigade organised a group of people to run firefighter forums throughout the whole organisation to, to just bust all these myths apart of what was actually happening with the austerity, with the workforce diversity. And she just says it was, it was a real turning point. It was so effective because 
they got firefighters and they had in that group doing delivering it it was across the board there were civilians there were facilitators change facilitators a couple of who would be considered what we would call crusty old fireys but were just old school thinkers as part of that group and they got it all worked out together how to deliver these forums and addressed it all and um, she tells me that that was the real turning point for change in the organisation, for everyone to get on board with each other and the new way of doing business. So that was one thing that I thought worked. Um, reverse mentoring um, is, and storytelling. Is, I think somebody yesterday spoke about the ADF um, when um, the young mm. women that were involved in the sexual harassment and their families um, came and spoke to... No, uh, Morrison. Morrison. Yeah, yeah, and that and the huge mm. impact um, it had on them, on them, um, and storytelling. I think a human connection. If you can get um, your equal opportunity commission to come into your organisation, <laughs> you will get change um, yeah. out of that. Apart from the things I've already mentioned, I think. Did you say someone's having a someone? Someone's oh, yeah, it's going through now. Oh, great! <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so out of that, apart from the things I've mentioned, we've also had um, meet like women forums, women's forums, and um, mentoring for women, for women as well. Because I mean, the findings were pretty horrific. Everyone knows there's sexism within your organisation um, in, in the emergency services, but the stories that came out of that were like sexual assaults. Uh, <laughs> numerous sexual assaults are senior members against young females. Um, that people would... And behaviour that we all put up with and, and things that are said that we all put up with because that's the, the nature of the beast in emergency services when you're working in what is meant to be a macho environment or, or has been. We just turn a blind eye to things and we accept behaviours. And so because of that report, everything's changed. Um, and, and the women mentoring things. So when one of you said that um, it's the women that keep the women down, yes, that's true. But it, I've noticed the change in the last 12 months or since the Veriac report was released that we are having all these meetings. And the men aren't, aren't happy about it because they want a man's meeting. So they went and did a man's meeting and that's fine. Um, but but these, these meetings are empowering the women um, and changing behaviours and, and changing the culture. So if you can have that done without blockages, and I, I don't know how you can block Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission, but anyway, um, there will be change. So... If it gets through, you will notice. It will get through eventually, I'm sure, but um, I, I just found it incredibly, incredibly ironic over the last couple of weeks that you know, there's a Supreme Court action. You know, we're not talking about just, please don't put it, send it out, it's going to make us look bad. It's just quite bizarre. Yeah. Um, the only final point I'd add to your question is um, there, I think it was made yesterday that um, there are structural barriers to a lot of them being achieved and like how the rostering and done and how human resources are structured and that came through in our research over and over again where progression to leadership roles, if you couldn't go on a five day roster um, without the kids then you couldn't, you couldn't progress. So um, even if middle managers are resisting, if the roster allows it then that system will, um, they'll be able to, at least to be able to progress. So I think those kind of um, structures also need to shift to be able, because it's, it's an easy out of, we, we did interview a few middle, female middle managers who said, look, it's just too hard to change the roster. We can't progress women because the roster's set like this and it'll be too expensive to change. It's a very easy out to say that. Well, if, this, if the structures at least allow it, middle managers don't have the same kind of fallback um, in why they can't progress their female firefighters. Hmm. So along with um, what I mentioned before about giving people space to grow, um, I think we've also got to celebrate our, our good our, our good men, the men who are supportive and, and not, um, I suppose, lowest common denominator, not lower our expectation of everybody down to that lowest common denominator. Celebrate 
the men who are progressive and are supportive of inclusion across across the board because um, if we're looking at all inclusion, it might be something, uh, you know, you might have a, um, a firefighter who's caring for his parents um, but doesn't want to tell people at work because that might be seen as soft, you know. Um, so inclusion's got to be across the board and, um, and it's everyone's responsibility. That's probably a fantastic and very positive note to lead off. <laughs> thank you all for, um, for being here and particularly um, thank the panel for giving up their time and insights this afternoon. Thank you. And are we here for each of you? Beautifully wrapped. <laughs> Um, the next session, Heather, is the debate, uh, which is not until three, I think, or five, two or something like that.